The Battle of Donbass, a new concentrated Russian offensive in the southeast of Ukraine, has started in earnest. The front line just a few miles from the hospice in Chazovyar, Donetsk. So this morning, the residents wait to be evacuated to a town in the west of Ukraine, over a thousand miles away. Residents like Maria, Luda, Sergei. Whatever about conditions here and end-of-life care in Donetsk, people like Gregory were at least cared for by the staff saying goodbye. <laughs> Ukrainian soldiers yesterday in the vast network of trenches in Donbass, trenches dug out first back in 2014. Last night, President Zelensky spoke about Russia's renewed full-scale offensive to the east, President Putin's unfinished business given renewed impetus by Russia's inability to take Kyiv. Зараз вже можна констатувати, що російські війська розпочали битву за Донбас, до якої давно готувались. Дуже значна частина всієї російської армії зараз концентрована для цього наступу. Moscow's intention to, quote, liberate the parts of Donbass its forces don't control was announced back in February. The Russian foreign minister today. This uh, operation in the east of Ukraine uh, is uh, uh, aimed, as was announced from the very beginning, to fully liberate the Donetsk and Lugansk republics. And this operation uh, will, will continue. It is beginning, uh, I mean, another stage of this operation is beginning. And with the statements, the strikes, at least one person, for example, killed in this one, in the frontline town of Kramatorsk. Moscow claims to have hit over a thousand targets overnight. The possible preamble to ground troops on the move, a significant increase in airstrikes over the last 24 hours. Donbass consists of two regions. Donetsk and Luhansk gets its name from the Donetsk Basin associated with the river Donetsk. Since 2014, parts of the Donbass have been controlled by Russian-backed forces. Now the Russian offensive is pushing west. The focus of the war likely to become this 300-mile front line and beyond. War forces familiarity with place names for all the wrong reasons. In the coming weeks, expect to hear a lot about places like Kremina, reportedly taken by Russian forces today, and places like Slavyansk. It was the city where the original Donbass conflict started back in 2014. Mariupol, a little further south, was bombarded again today. The target, a pocket of resistance inside the Azovstal industrial complex where Ukrainian troops and civilians are still holed up. Well, joining me now is General Sir Simon Mell, who served in the British Army for four decades. Now, in your experience, what do you think the significance of the Donbass region is and Russian troops seemingly going to that area right now? Well, it's the area that Putin and the Russians always wanted. It's very mineral-rich energy, uh, um, uh, grain, of course. And if you can get the Donbass and Mariupol, you can link up a land bridge to Crimea and you achieve at least the basic aims that uh, Putin had from his invasion. So what's taking place now is really the bare minimum that Putin would want from this offensive and invasion. And um, what do you think are the reasons for the changes right now? Is it because things haven't been going well? Putin needs to say that he's got some sort of victory? Yes, well, it's probably what the Russian army, from a military point of view, would have wanted to do in the first place. They went in with false premises, a ridiculously uh, optimistic idea of how would collapse the Ukraine as a fake country, etc. And uh, this is really what the 
Russian army probably can professionally do. They've taken a hell of a setback. They're having to resupply, bring new uh, new organizations in, new equipment, battle casualty replacements, logistics, new chain of command. So they're starting very much from a, a rather weakened position. Uh, but that doesn't mean they won't achieve objectives. Uh, they're shaping the operations at the moment, remembering that before the first Gulf War, we did a six-week air and artillery bombard before we put the ground forces in. I don't think it'll go on that long, uh, but the Russian ground forces will eventually make some assault somewhere along that 300-mile line uh, with the right concentration of forces. Sure. sure. Um, um, Simon Mel, what do you think this will mean uh, for the coming days for our viewers who are watching, who will want to know what's going to happen in those regions? They have family there. They have friends there. What will it mean in those particular areas? And just briefly. Yes, I think, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of probing attacks by the Russians, uh, a much greater use of artillery and air power, uh, a lot more smashing, I'm afraid, of villages and towns, and, of course, trying to uh, demoralize the Ukrainian, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian army. And the Ukrainian army will need to hold on to some coherence, because eventually uh, the Russians will attempt to do some breakthrough in scale somewhere along that line, and Ukraine needs to keep the capacity uh, to do a counter-offensive or a counter-attack uh, and keep its reserves uh, ready and able to, uh, to, uh, to counter the Russians when they work out exactly where they're going to attempt to break through Thank on that 300-mile uh, front line. line. Thank you very much, General Sir Simon Mel. Had a bit of trouble with the line yeah, there, but thank you for persevering. Thanks a lot. Well, after President Zelensky's announcement that Russia's eastern ground offensive has begun, Ukrainians are bracing themselves. Of course, most of the country is unaffected by land fighting directly, but the coming weeks, both Russia and Ukraine agree, could be pivotal. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, joins us now from Odessa. Alex. Yes, the country braces itself indeed. Let's have a look at some of the, the propaganda that we've seen today travelling across the country. In Russia, the Z battlefield symbol of the Kremlin has become very much a brand from the Moscow underground right across the country. So to here, have a look at this in an inverse way. This is a motorway sign saying that the Z symbol is the modern swastika. There are plenty of other signs on the gantry, but none we could really tell you what they say at 7 o'clock in the evening, so to speak. So to the battle itself, two things going on um, that you need to really be aware of tonight. The air bomb bombardment, the ballistic missile strikes, expect a lot of that in coming days. It's already started to degrade Ukraine's ability to fight a war. They are, on the whole, fairly accurate. And then, of course, this 300-mile front in the east, which is opening up. Now, the Russians learnt lessons from the debacle up north around the capital, Kiev. They have much shorter supply lines and they vastly outnumber in materiel, personnel and everything the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians, of course, though, have almost limitless supply lines going back to NATO and beyond in terms of battlefield equipment. They still don't have enough, they constantly say, but it is there. And they have one thing you cannot put a price on. Every Ukrainian soldier, man and woman, knows exactly why they're fighting and what they're fighting for. You can't say the same for the Russians. To sum up, expect this to go on through, I'm afraid, the spring into the summer on this Eastern Front. Think in terms of weeks, quite probably months, not days. Back to you. Alex, thanks very much. Well, earlier today, I spoke to the woman at the forefront of the international legal effort to hold Russia accountable for alleged war crimes committed in Ukraine. Irina Venediktova is currently investigating 500 suspects. And I began by asking her when she hopes to bring the first cases to court. Actually, we have different cases, more than 7,000 cases. You mentioned about our main war criminals. They are suspects in the, our anchor case. Unfortunately, all of them are in the Russian Federation. It's a top level of politicians, militaries, and propaganda agents. We started to prosecute them in absentia. But from other side, um, I hope that they can be uh, clients of the International Criminal Court too. From other side, we have people who are now in Ukraine, our war prisoners. And um, we, start, we will start prosecuting them in the war crimes. When you look at all the evidence you're assessing 
mass graves that you've had to look at in Butcher, sexual violence, evidence of indiscriminate shelling. What toll does that take on you and your team? Today is the 55th day of war, and every day we have more, uh, we see it more and more atrocities. And when we see every day burnt bodies, when you see uh, pieces of projectiles in, just in the chest of kids or elderly people, when you see again new statistic of deaths of civilians, it's actually you just like live in horror movie. But from other side, we are prosecutors. We should do our job without emotionally. And even now, when we have such huge number of deaths of civilians, we understand that now we should think only about our strategy of investigation, about how we should to collect evidences, how we pro can protect them, and how we can use our judicial front of international colleagues, other prosecutors, how to use all these possibilities to give our results in a more, as more fast as we can. So when you talk about trying to be dispassionate about what you're seeing, however hard that is, does it help to hear international leaders like Joe Biden talk about genocide? Or given how hard it is to prove genocide, was that overstepping the mark? I hear all politicians and I appreciate for their hearts, for their energy and for their support. But I will do my job as a prosecutor. And now, of course, I want to say that we appreciate for the, these words, but Ukraine needs more weapons. Um, we should to arm our army and maybe this uh, terrible horror will be finished as more uh, as more fast as possible. And if Ukrainian forces will take everything which they request, we can finish this war very fast. They're very brave people and they're ready to fight for our lives and for our investigations process, because without victories, everything will be impossible. Irina Venediktova, thank you very much for your time. Well, let's return now to our top story and the Prime Minister's apology to Parliament over Partygate today. Let's talk now to the Conservative MP and former Chief Whip, Mark Harper. Mark Harper, you stood up in the Commons and said that you didn't have confidence in the Prime Minister anymore. Why did you decide that today was the day? Well, I, I said it today because this was the first day Parliament was back uh, after the Prime Minister was found by the Metropolitan Police to have broken his own Covid uh, laws. Um, and I don't think uh, that is tenable. I don't think he's been straightforward about it. Um, and that's really the reason why I came to the conclusion I did. And he's also asking, effectively, Conservative MPs, uh, decent men and women on my side of the House of Commons, to start defending the indefensible. And I don't think that's what a leader does. Uh, and it was for all of those reasons that I said that I felt that he, he should go. You said he hasn't been straightforward. Is he, in fact, a liar? Well, I don't think he's been straightforward in Parliament. I think his... The things he said are just about tenable if you yourself weren't at any of these events. You can say that you were assured about things and you can say that you were you know, given assurances that all the rules were followed. If it turns out, as it now has, that he was at events that broke the rules, his own laws that he told us had to be followed in detail, and if you varied them in any way, it would be putting people's lives at risk then I think some of his answers don't stack up. And in his own ministerial code, if ministers um, knowingly mislead Parliament, then they have to resign. Well, he said he didn't knowingly mislead Parliament because he, it didn't occur to him that he was breaking the rules on that party that he's been fined for. Well, the, the problem with that argument is, um, and we'll just put aside the fact that there are five other uh, gatherings that the Prime Minister was at, because I don't know the Metropolitan Police will conclude. I think if you set laws which were the central political and social question facing our country and which you told people, both your, you yourself in Parliament, at the Downing Street podium and in hard-hitting posters up and down the country, that people had to follow the letter of them, 
And if they didn't, they were putting people's lives at risk. And I think you have a responsibility to understand those rules and to set an example in following them. And the fact that he think? hasn't, and he's broken his own laws and had to pay a penalty for doing so, I, I think means that those answers that he gave in Parliament, I, I don't think he was being straight with us. So why do you think so few of your colleagues on the Conservative benches have, have joined you in calling for his resignation? Well, look, th this is very difficult. I, I was prepared to wait for the Metropolitan Police to reach this conclusion. Some of my colleagues may well be waiting for the uh, Met's investigations to, to finish. I mean, there are five other events that the Prime Minister was at that they're looking into. Um, they may wish to wait for that. They may wish for the Sue Gray report to be published. For me, I was happy to, to wait to judge the Prime Minister on the facts. And the facts that we know today are that he broke the rules on at least one occasion. I don't think he's been straightforward about it. And he's now asking people to defend the indefensible with, with right. arguments which I don't really think hold any water. Okay. And I don't think that's reasonable. So for me, that's the, the threshold for me. Other colleagues will want other tests to be met. But every colleague is going to have to make a decision one way or the other about whether they wish the Prime Minister to lead us into the yeah. next election. Well, on that point, how big a price do you think you're going to pay at the May elections for this? And beyond that, do you think he could cost you the general election? Well, on the local elections, um, there aren't elections in, in many parts of England, and I, I genuinely don't know what the response will be. Four years ago, Labour did quite well and we did quite badly. So uh, actually Labour are coming off a high watermark. So I don't know what the results will be. Um, I know where people do raise this on the doorstep, it is very difficult for our candidates. Um, for the general election, I think if you look at the opinion polls about what voters think about the Prime Minister, uh, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult if he's still leading the party. And that's why I've reached the conclusion um, that we need to have a new leader. So he could lose you the next election? Yes, I think so. I think if you look at the views of voters, a very significant proportion of our voters, people who vote Conservative, think he should go. And a majority of Conservative voters in the opinion polls say that they don't think he's being honest right. with Parliament about these events. And I think that's a very difficult situation if you're trying to win people's trust at an election. Mark Harper, thanks very much for joining us.